will be starting in just a minute. All of you who haven't yet done it, it's a request. Please turn off your cameras and microphones. Deepin sir, apne ek to khel kare presentation ta bondh kore din. Sir, uh, we should start. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this third session of our webinar series. Today, Professor Dibankar Banerjee will be speaking on a topic which has intrigued us for a very long time, sunspots. Sunspots is a very intriguing subject, and Professor Banerjee will take us through this. Since Professor Banerjee is waiting here for a long time, he's been with us for the last 20 or 25 minutes, we'll cut this welcome address very short. Simply, I'm welcoming all of you today. But since Sky Watchers is a, is a group of people who enjoy sky watching, there should be a note of caution from us regarding solar observation. We should be very careful, very, very careful, because looking at the sun is dangerous. We've all at some point of time in our lives have done the very mischievous experiment of burning paper with a magnifying glass and sunlight. Now what the magnifying glass does is it converges the light as well as the heat to a single point on the piece of paper and the intense heat sets fire to the paper. Now just imagine your eyes at the spot where the point on the paper was because an optical device does the same. It converges light to a sharp, to, a, to, to its focus to give you a sharp image. So once the heat of the sun is converged to your retina, it's done. But in that case, is it a fact that you won't observe the sun? We will, definitely we will. Now, how will you do that? We can use special safety, safety viewers especially special goggles made for the purpose of solar observation. We can look at the look or see the sun through a projection simply by making a pinhole attachment for it. We can project the image obtained through a telescope on a piece of paper. The same way the same thing can be applied by projecting the image through a binocular. Or if we at all have to see a very magnified image of the disk of the sun, there are proper and adequate filters which can be attached on the face of the telescope or the binocular so that we can see it properly that it that is the that that filter cuts off about 99% of the sunlight so that we can view it properly now we with these notes of caution for solar observation we request everyone do not try to look at the sun with any optical device which is not properly filtered. Never do that. Never. The process, the damage is irreversible. That for the observation part. Now, a social responsibility. The second note is that during these times, please be safe. Wear a mask whenever outside. Wash your hands with soap regularly for at least 30 seconds. Whenever possible, if not, if you're not being able to wash your hands, do sanitize your hands. Be safe. And do not treat COVID positive patients as aliens. They are like us. Thank you. With this note, I welcome you once again, all of you to this webinar. I'm handing over the session to Dipankar. Not sorry, not Professor Dipankar Banerjee, but Dipankar from our station, who will take you through the rest of the process. 
Thank you. Dipankar. Yes, thank you, Shoykot sir, for a nice introduction to our third webinar. Uh, again, it's my utmost pleasure to have everyone in this uh, webinar organized by Skywatchers Association. Uh, in these tough times, we have this series of webinars uh, started uh, two weeks back uh, when we first got an idea of our neighborhood stars. Uh, then we have uh, some mysteries of space time revealed to us. And now, today, we have it's our honor and privilege that Professor Dipankar Banerjee has agreed to give a lecture in the third webinar uh, on a topic which probably we all love, the sun, our star. Uh, actually, Professor Banerjee needs no introduction, no formal introduction, because a personality like him has so many accolades under his name. Uh, he is the director of Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences at Nainital. He is associated with uh, International Astronomical Union, Royal Astronomical Society, Astronomical Society of India, Plasma Society of India, to name a few. Sun and the solar atmosphere is his area of research interest. And he is a stalwart in this field. Uh, and he is an internationally acclaimed person in this field. We all know that. And he is also the head of the science working group and co-principal investigator of the coronagraph payload to be launched in on Indian satellite Aditya by ISRO. He is also associated with NASA's punch mission, uh, to name a very few about him. Uh, and so before uh, I request Professor Banerjee to deliver his lecture. I would like to request all the participants again to please turn off their mic and turn off their camera. And please do not ask questions in between the lecture. If you have any questions, please post it in the chat box. We will have an interactive session after the talk. And we will try to accommodate as many questions as we can, because we have also a live streaming going on YouTube. So we will take also questions from there. And when Sir is presenting, uh, please uh, click on this presentation tab bearing the name of Professor Banerjee. And please pin to that screen so that you can uh, easily see the presentation. And it's, again, a request to all the participants that please do not present your own screen. Yes, sir. One moment. Just please remind everyone that there should be no intercommunication between them during the session, failing which we will be we'll have no other option but to remove that person from the uh, webinar. Just tell them. OK, and uh, when everyone will ask questions, please try uh, to ask questions on the topic related to uh, this lecture. And if there is a technical difficulty, uh, please bear with us. And you can post it in the chat box. We will, we shall try to uh, fix the matter as soon as possible. And one more thing I want to mention that at the end of the session, a link of a feedback form will be provided in the chat box and also in the YouTube live streaming live chat. Please fill up and submit that form so that we can issue the e-certificates on the basis of that. We will issue the e-certificates on the basis of the feedback form only. Uh, now, it's my privilege and honor to request Professor Banerjee to take charge of the session and deliver his talk. Please, sir. Uh, sir, uh, your mic is muted. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I hope you can see the full screen now. Yes, sir. OK. So thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to come uh, close to uh, you know so many people uh, through this uh, virtual world. Uh, now this is the new normal, and we have to get used to it. Though I love uh, giving talks and to interact with people face to face, but unfortunately that uh, situation is uh, not there. So we have to use this uh, kind of uh, mode of uh, you know uh, presentation. Uh, so it's a new challenge for all of us. And I hope uh, we can convey some excitement and you know some of our experience, uh, what we do professionally uh, with the, you all, so that you also can get a little bit of interest on the subject. And at least if there are a younger uh, generation in the audience, uh, they can get motivated 
uh, towards uh, you know research, particularly in astrophysics and the kind of thing which I do, uh, namely solar physics. So, so before I go into the subject, I thought you know I'll just let you know where I am right now. And uh, sir, uh, sir uh, can I just uh, interrupt you for once? Sure. Uh, sir, uh, there is a uh, screen showing in uh, in the bottom of your screen that hide and stop sharing. All oh, right, right, right. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Right. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Oops. Uh, this one. Now, now that yes. is given, right? Yes, sir. At home. Oh, okay. Fine. Fine. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point. So um, I am actually at this point of time at Nainital, uh, and this is our campus called Manorati. Uh, Dipankar, you are able to see my uh, uh, cursor, right? Uh, yes, sir. Clearly. Okay. okay, good, good. So it is this Aryabhata Research Institute, uh, uh, you know, has two campuses now. We started our operations from uh, Nanital at Manora Peak, uh, which is the top panel. And more recently, we have a new campus uh, at uh, Devastal, which is 50 kilometer east of Nanital city. And uh, there are, of course, uh, obvious reasons uh, that Nanital climate uh, is, as, is not as good as it used to be uh, because of, you know, uh, too much uh, population and uh, you know, industrialization and so on. So we have moved into the vessel and we will, I will just briefly tell what all are there. And since you are all, uh, you know, uh, nighttime uh, watchers, uh, you will love to uh, come this place. And if opportunity arises in future, I will be happy to uh, accommodate you as well. So this is our campus. Uh, this is the building actually, and, and I am sitting in a room uh, this is the window, <laughs> if I just uh, look towards my left. And uh, this uh, host a uh, few uh, telescopes, which are... So this is a uh, one meter uh, Sampuranan uh, telescope, which is operational since 1972. We have 15 centimeter solar tower telescope, which is operational from 1993, till, uh, still takes uh, images at H-alpha filter. We also have a 50 centimeter Smith telescope, uh, you know, which is operational for 2009. So this is a sort of, you know, a bunch of uh, old, uh, I would say, telescopes in this particular campus where we all live now. But uh, more recent, yeah, these are the, some of the close-ups of uh, these two, uh, you know, telescopes, which is just uh, been uh, referred here. And this is my closest subject, the star of the sun, which we look at. Uh, we study mostly solar flares from this uh, uh, small telescope. Now I just give a, gl a glimpse of uh, Devastar, uh, which is about two and a half kilometer above uh, sea level. And uh, initially we had this 1.3 meter telescope, which is operational from 2010 onwards on regular operation. Lots of uh, observations are taken from this telescope. This is a very modern uh, telescope. And of course, this is the nation's pride now, the largest uh, optical telescope from this part of the globe. 3.6 meter is the primary mirror size, uh, and the uh, you know first light has been obtained from 2016. Uh, 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 Prime Minister inaugurated this uh, you know telescope, and we also have a four meter liquid mirror telescope. This is a very specific, uh, very uh, ingenious uh, design. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just using uh, mercury as a deflecting surface. Uh, so this is uh, a unique facility and it is coming up actually, uh, we had some technical issues so we couldn't uh, still get it in 2019 uh, uh, December, which was uh, scheduled first light. But uh, as soon as this current condition uh, uh, you know, uh, goes away, we hope that we will get the first light from this particular telescope. This is a very, very unique facility. Nowhere else in the world actually it is there at this point of time. This is a unique experiment. and. Belgians and Canadians and others are also involved as an international project which we are going to host here. Uh, these are close-up views of um, uh, you know 1.3 meter telescope, and as you can see, the beautiful entire Himalayan range in the background. So this is again uh, uh, you know our privilege. Uh, thankfully, you know we have uh, chosen a subject and uh, a, a profession which allows us to you know enjoy the nature and uh, our day to day activities you know uh, you know immensely we are indebted for that uh, for this opportunity as well uh, frankly you know we work uh, of course uh, 24 by 7 365 days uh, even say the saturday afternoon 5 i am in office i have no problem in sharing my experience with uh, you know all of you uh, through whatever means uh, uh, you know uh, opportunities come so this is the nation's pride 3.6 meter devastal optical telescope uh, which is dedicated for, of course, uh, you know, uh, more distant objects because uh, 
larger the telescope, of course, you can see fainter objects. Uh, so a lot of new uh, discoveries we expect uh, will come from this uh, telescope. Now I will switch to my uh, uh, subject area, uh, sun, uh, like all stars, it is a dynamic star, always active, always changing. More we learn about it, more we learn about all stars. So there is always a question that sun is one of the oldest probably astronomical objects for, uh, for millennia. Uh, you know, people have been looking at and uh, trying to study. So what is so unique about sun? Uh, by still, uh, is it still necessary to really study the sun in some greater detail? The answer is yes, because there are many reasons I will come to that. But if you even look at this particular uh, image, which is taken from a extreme ultraviolet uh, a telescope uh, from one of the NASA solar uh, mission called Solar Dynamic Observatory, it appears, you know, the sun is always there. And it emits the same amount of light and energy and so on and so forth. You can see from this particular small little movie that sun is actually all the time changing. It changes at different time scales, sometimes in seconds, minutes, hours. Uh, and I will talk about today about uh, you know centuries and millennia. Sun do change. So uh, uh, we can obviously the direct question what we have to answer is if sun changes, what is the impact it can make on our livelihood, on our life, and so on and so forth. Now we understand that the total output or total radiation which comes out from the sun uh, is almost constant. It changes actually 0.1% with solar cycle, what I will talk about. Talk about huh? With kind of 11 year periodicity, it does change by a very small amount, 0.1. Is there an impact of that 0.1% change into our climate and so on? And the bigger question is, suppose tomorrow, the sun changes not by 0.1, but by but larger amount. What will happen? And this precise measurement of 0.1% of change of solar radiation has only come out in the last 20, 30 years after the space era. Because from the ground, we really cannot accurately, with such precision, measure the solar output. Because always the climate is, I mean, our atmosphere is there. And the atmosphere itself you know, absorbs certain things and you know, radiates, radiates and so on. So there is not possible to you know, estimate the output of the sun until we go to space. So here is a beautiful movie about a small little you know, uh, ejection which is coming out from a bright region here. And uh, what you see underneath the bright region is a sunspot. So that is the story, or that is the, uh, the uh, keyboard which we'll be using uh, uh, probably a few hundreds of times. And what you see that in the atmosphere of the sunspot, there are, looks like there are certain kind of loop-like structures. And this loop also is very bright as compared to the surrounding, surrounding region. That means whenever it is a bright means, it has lots of hot material inside that because it is emitting excess as compared to the... Uh, so what again directly boils down, that sunspots are probably some special region. We will find out what is the speciality about it. And that allows the plasma to be confined in a, in a very fixed region. That's why those you know, regions are much brighter and more dynamic as compared to the other regions. So this is a movie where you see the material is ejected. Some material goes back into interplanetary space. Some again falls back. So there are lots of you know, implications of these kind of events. Since you all are very much interested about the stars, sun is a normal star. It is a middle-aged uh, star uh, and a main sequence star of spectral jet G G2. You don't have to worry about too much about this uh, you know, jargons. But basically, the, uh, the point to be noted is it is a, uh, not an abnormal star. It is very normal, like our, our all human beings. We undergo a, 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 a sort of you know, lifetime, life cycle. Uh, in the middle age, we all behave more or less the same and, and things like that. Sun is a special star because it is the only star on which we can resolve the spatial scale on which fundamental processes take place. So this is very important because majority of the other objects what you see in the sky, you observe as a point object. So you really do not know too much details of the surface. What is it? What is the shape? What is the big, uh, you know, uh, any structures are there or not? Whereas sun is our nearest star, so that because of the advent of now better and better telescopes and, and technology, we are able to see much more details on the, surface, uh, you know, on the surface and also in, in the different atmosphere and so on. So, so one example which you saw just in the previous movie. 
of course, sun is a special star because it provides almost all the energy to the earth. I mean, our existence is because sun is at an appropriate distance away from us, and it's also emitting certain amount of energy which allows us for our life and so on. Sun is also a special star because it provides us with a unique laboratory in which to learn about various branches of physics. Normally, if I talk, give a talk in a physics uh, student's audience, I will sort of try to impress on that, you know, whether you are studying nuclear physics, if you are studying atomic physics, uh, molecular physics, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, plasma physics uh, or, or uh, theories on chaos, you know, there are direct applications of those theories in the sun. Because what happens is some of the, uh, you know, physics knowledge which you have always needs to be verif uh, verified in a laboratory setup. But we cannot achieve those conditions in a normal laboratory because of the limitations of the size, the temperature, what you can achieve, magnetic field strength, what you can achieve, and so on. So Sun ideally provides a laboratory where you can verify some of your new physics or new theories which you are proposing to be you know, verified. So really, really, Sun is a very unique laboratory for various branches of physics. And it has been used you know, uh, from particle physics to a number of things that I can go on talking about. Of course, probably most of this audience uh, doesn't need much uh, you know, introduction about our own galaxy. Uh, we are situated somewhere in this orion arm where this red arrow is uh, you know, indicated. Sun orbits the center of the Milky Way in about 225 million years. But the solar system has a velocity of 250 kilometer per second. Hmm? Our galaxy, our own galaxy, consists of about 100 billion other stars. And there are about 100 billion other galaxies. Today, I'm only talking about one object in this billions and billions of you know, numbers what you can talk about. So you can imagine how much uh, you know, we know about our universe uh, by just looking at these numbers, it's it's uh, staggering, you know. Of course, Sun has inspired mythology in many cultures, including the ancient Egyptians and Aztecs, Native Americans, Indians, and the Chinese. Actually, Mr. Shoika uh, nicely introduced, uh, you know, our own good old Sun, and it has been uh, always an inspiring, uh, you know, object in the sky for for millennia, in, in fact. The sun is 333,000 times more massive than the earth and it contains 99.86% of the mass of the entire solar system. This is again one very important point for people to understand that when you look for a many body problem, then if one object is so much heavier, then you can imagine that all your you know, dynamics is primarily governed by the location of that particular object and center of mass and so on. So it's just an indication because a lot of people have these wrong uh, conceptions, you know, if some small little satellite move from there to there, whether that will have any effect to the other planets and things like that. You can imagine that uh, effect will be obviously less because the most heavy you know, object in this entire system is in, in one location. Of course, Sun uh, has 78% hydrogen, which is getting burnt into helium that through a nuclear reaction, PP chain reaction, which is happening in the core, and 2% of other elements. So as long as, you know, more percentage of helium hydrogen is there, then uh, we will be in the main spins and so on. Total energy radiated is 100 billion tons of TNT per second. This is a unit of one thermal uh, thermonuclear reaction. I mean, one hydrogen bomb, if you can think about, then there are 100 billion tons of hydrogen bomb every second exploding inside the sun. So we are fortunate that we are away from that uh, guy uh, to an appropriate distance. Now, this is a gentleman which really changed uh, our philosophy, our understanding of uh, you know science, and of course he looked at the sun as well. Uh, Galileo 1610, uh, using the first uh, you know just invented at that time the telescope just came in, was the first person to observe and record the path of sunspots across the sun for several weeks. What he noted, this uh, uh, you know this black dot or patches what you see on the surface. So this is actually animation made from Galileo's own drawing. So Galileo drew the positions of these black patches, which later on we know as sunspots. And subsequently, that, that position is, is not in the same location. So obviously, that can happen if that object is rotating. So he was first to point out that you know, the sun is, uh, you know, uh, is probably a rotating object. At that point in time, he didn't know that sunspot I mean, the sun is rotating not also rigidly, but it is rotating 
like a differential rotation because he was using only sunspots as a as a tracer so his only object was sunspots which again we'll see appears only certain latitude band so if if this is the you know so of course this is a ground based uh, images so the north is somewhere here south is here so this is the latitude band where these sunspots are coming and if you just follow that in subsequent days uh, and then from that you can calculate what is the rotational speed of this object and so on and so forth hmm? this is exactly galileo's own hand drawing you know which is which still used for calculation of the rotation but now today we also know that sun rotates differentially that means the equator rotates faster than the pole this makes life very very complicated of course you can imagine you know if you are standing somewhere and your tummy is being rotated at one speed and the head is rotating at a different speed what kind of you know shearing you know motions and all that will uh, result in your know, inside your body and inside the sun that's what exactly happens and that's actually one of the major major ingredient for this generation of the sun spots and so on so that is the story for today now certain day if you look at the sun you will find it's very boring I and mean, like you know it's, this is called the white light images you guys are very good in taking images so if you take a white light filter and take an images of course as uh, mr shrikant uh, you know warned you never look through the uh, <laughs> telescope also uh, to the sun uh, you will completely destroy your eyes but if you have a, 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 a you know the uh, electricity image or, uh, or, a, or a film or something you know you will get this image so some days you don't find actually any dark those patches on this and then some day you find this uh, patches so now this is a big uh, mystery right these sun spots why they come at some time and uh, why they come at only certain places only why they don't come uh, you know to all the way to high latitudes or why are uh, seen here do you see sun spots uh, uh, close to the pole no why so this is a question i will ask i mean i will you know first pose today and we'll try to give you some answer as well from a science point of view so these are called sun spots of course if you look at more uh, you know uh, closer means you should use a bigger telescope and try to uh, look at these objects you see these are the typical sun spots there is a core which is called the umbra where the magnetic field basically sun spots nothing but concentrated magnetic field region and the concentrated mag magnetic field region the core is called the umbra uh, and which is dark and which is cold and and so on and as you can see here uh, the size of a sun spot is as comparable to the size of the earth so these are uh, you know natural tokamak you know if you have uh, uh, you know heard about tokamak this plasma confinement experiments and all that uh, people do uh, you know this is the natural tokamak you have in the sun so now sun spots as i said are magnetic structures that emerge from beneath the surface so what happens is this is again an animation because we can't really in see inside the sun we only can see the surface of the sun and the atmosphere here what is happening is that these white lines represent the magnetic field lines and these white field lines are nothing but like a flux tube so they are like a rubber tube if you take a rubber tube and insert it in a sort of bucket of water what happens is the rubber tube tends to you know come up because of some property called buoyancy i think this is all our, our we have uh, known that's the reason why the you know the uh, the ship is actually floating on a water and so on so this property if it is a magnetic uh, you know plasma then that that is named as uh, magnetic buoyancy and because of that magnetic buoyancy you know these flux tubes which are nothing but collection of magnetic field lines you know if you have a bar magnet then there are always you know magnetic field lines comes out of the north pole and then in the uh, you know south pole of course these are imaginary you know uh, lines but how do you know that there is a magnetic field lines what you do is you sprinkle some you know iron filings and then you will see that iron filings are following certain you know pattern and that pattern is known as the magnetic field lines so here in the case of the sun also it is the same thing a collection of these thousands of magnetic field lines we can conceptualize as a flux tube which is very similar to if you take is a rubber tube example what i was giving inside a bucket of water this is the sort of very uh, simple terms the what is happening with this uh, rubber tube this rubber tubes essentially gets generated at the base of the convection zone i have not talked about much about the inside uh, structure of the sun essentially just 30% inside the sun the energy is propagated by a process called convection 
very similar to if you take a bucket of water and then start boiling beyond certain you know temperature uh, difference of gradient when it sets up you see that the you know some material comes up the hot material comes up then the cool material goes down that's what is called the convection inside the sun that 30 percent inside is basically a convective layer and material uh, is always getting churned back and forth and so on so here in the right side you see this movie where it is depicting this or, or, or this anime or this uh, you know cartoon uh, where it is depicting this convective cells this size and this rubber tube basically it floats because of this property as as you have seen here initially uh, the tube is uh, stretched and it is at the, 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 the base of the convection zone but because of the magnetic bias it comes up of course uh, it, it, this is like a stretch tube if you can compare with even the rubber rubber uh, you know rubber band it's very similar so if uh, if you pull the rubber band there is a tension into that and that doesn't allow you to pull it uh, as you as you like but still uh, you know if one force is dominating over the other and so on eventually the flux tube will rise and it will form these pair of sunspots so always sunspots will be in pairs one will be north polarity and the other will be uh, south polarity and so on because the field line comes out of one uh, you know one uh, location and then ends in the other location of course sunspots also is a confined uh, region where lots of plasma is uh, you know confined and so on and so forth there are certain mathematical things which i will probably skip but if somebody has questions later on from physics background i will be happy to answer now the question comes is about the different atmospheric layers of the sun this is what you see in the photosphere this is the visible surface i mean uh, earlier if the image you have seen is in the white light this is taken in another another uh, filter but it represents the photosphere and you see a pair of sunspot suppose i go to about 1200 or 1300 kilometers uh, you know away from the solar surface i get the picture something like this still the sunspots are there but the background picture is actually quite different and there are lots of physics actually involved in that i will not go into the detail because i'm just focusing today into the sunspot now i go a little more higher few hundred kilometers more high say 1700 kilometers or something i take a picture from h alpha filter i get a picture of the upper chromosphere and you see the structure again the background structure is very different still the sunspots are there it is anchored like a big you know uh, pillar uh, which is all anchored probably deep inside the sun and uh, going out in the atmosphere but the surrounding atmosphere has more finer structures so there are a lot of these filamentary structures which is seen everywhere around the sunspot so that's again you can imagine that how the atmosphere is getting more and more complicated and more structured and so on so forth the simple photosphere where you see just the sunspot and uh, the surrounding surfaces are looks like you know pretty boring and simple and so on and so forth that's also not strictly true but now we see more and more complications when we go higher higher up in the atmosphere and if you go really high in the uh, atmosphere say several thousand kilometer then what you see is a surface called the corona huh? this image is taken from x-ray the temperature of the corona is millions of kelvin of course this is a mystery in the in the solar physics that why the atmosphere and the temperature grows higher uh, as compared to the photospheric temperature because this is not expected if you are going up up in the mountain and then further up normally from the surface say, your temperature drops so no thermodynamics actually can explain this there are non-thermal processes which are now uh, believed to be responsible and some of us actually do uh, real research on this and there are a lot of understanding about you know why the corona is hot and this kind of structured and so on and so forth Incidentally, the, with the corona, what uh, we are uh, all been affected at this point of time uh, has come also from an eclipse uh, a image of the corona. Uh, the solar corona, the structure of the solar corona, as taken from a typical uh, total solar eclipse, resembles, resembles this you know, image of the virus, what you have, with all these uh, small little filamentary structures and all that. And in fact, that's the origin of the name uh, of this virus as well. Now I will go back to a little bit of history. As uh, Mr. Shrikov pointed out, that uh, people have been looking at the sunspot for, for centuries now. What is plotted here is yearly sunspot number. I've mentioned that sometimes you have some sunspots, sometimes you may not have sunspots, sometimes you have lots of sunspots. So here, what is plotted here for the last 400 years, the variation of the sunspot number, which clearly depicts that sunspot number goes high at a certain point, which is called the solar activity maxima. Then it is followed by the number drops and you get a minima, 
where the sunspot number is very, very low. Hmm? And again, it goes up. But you see, typically, the periodicity duration is uh, roughly 11 years. But the amplitude of these is very much vary. Hmm? This was first observed actually by Swabe uh, during this period, which is uh, you know uh, marked as uh, two vertical uh, lines here. He uh, he counted the sunspots over a period of you know 30, 40 years, and then he uh, observed this uh, you know kind of behavior. That's how it is named under under him, often called Swabe cycle also. So this is called uh, is named as. Uh, solar cycle, but there's another very, very interesting aspect to note from this particular figure is way back in 1650 to 1700, there are hardly any sunspots recorded. What went wrong? I mean, was uh, sun sleeping or it was not rotating or what? I mean, uh, sunspots were not generating. That we still do not have a, actually a full-fledged answer to this question. This is something which Wander first reported from old uh, records, compiling all the data. That's why it's called the Wander minima. 50 years, almost there were no sunspots. What was the effect of that? Was there any effect in uh, our climate or our atmosphere? The Volga River, which is one of the major rivers in, the, in Russia and Europe, was frozen for 40 years. In Europe, several thousands of people died because of extreme cold condition. So it appears very clearly there is a direct correlation of lower solar activity with our climate. And I don't think in the modern day we can afford this. So it is very important for us to know whether such kind of behavior is going to come in the near future. First of all, we have to understand why did it happen. Then only we can you know, predict. So this is, again, some of us do now by looking at the older historical data and try to understand this. What is the physics behind this cycle? And then if we understand adequately, then we can say what is there in the future. So that's the prediction. Uh, this is a prediction based on science, nothing, nothing else. Huh? So let us first now find out what are the properties of the sunspot, which this particular theory, which I'm trying to uh, you know, uh, tell you today, uh, needs to explain. First of all, sunspot always comes in pair. This is again a photospheric image taken from a uh, Japanese satellite in a G-band. The background image, what you see, is now called the magnetogram. That means the distribution of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. This sophistication has been, uh, you know, been only possible in the last 30, 40 years. Before that, we didn't have uh, this kind of uh, uh, possibilities. Of course, Hale was the first to point out that the solar sunspots are magnetic uh, uh, regions. And then subsequently, Zeeman effect, uh, which is used for you know, splitting of uh, spectral lines to measure the strength of the magnetic field, is directly used here to produce this kind of map. So it does provide us today the distribution of the magnetic field on the, uh, on the surface of the sun. This is a close-up of a, a particular region. So what you see is here a, a, a sunspot group is commonly known as the active region. And active region have systematic tilt. Tilt means these two guys have certain angle between them. And this angle seems to increase with latitude. In the some phase of the cycle, in the beginning of the solar cycle, what we see is that the sunspots tend to appear in a higher latitude. And with the progression of the cycle, you know, they tend to appear in the lower latitude. When they appear in the higher latitude, they seem to have a greater tilt as compared to the lower latitude. So all these properties that I am saying is has to be explained by the theory which I am trying to invoke. Now, this is again a similar thing, but for the full disk. If you took a look at the full disks, you can see that there are lots of active regions. Here it is the one active region, there is another active region. So in the northern hemisphere, if you really uh, pay your attention to this uh, colors, the yellow guys are to the right side of the green fellows. Whereas if you look at the southern hemisphere, the, the green fellows are actually to the right side of the blue fellows. So that means the polarity orientation is opposite in the two hemispheres. You see, these are all observations. So the way we build the story is that you we have certain observations. That means if you want to have a theory, that these all these observational properties has to be explained by the theory. So sunspot cycle animations are produced like this. That the, in the beginning of the cycle, the sunspots are appearing in the higher latitude, and with the progress of the solar cycle, they produce uh, they tend to come in the lower latitude. And if we just 
plot it in this way, uh, the spot position in latitude versus years, it produces this kind of diagram. This is called the butterfly diagram. Huh? This is nothing but looks like a butterfly, which seems to be you know, repeating time and again. Mm? This, so if you have a theory, again, it has to be, uh, it has to have a solution, which is, uh, which is periodic and the periodicity has to be roughly 11 year. And then these properties of, you know, uh, of uh, sunspot appearing in the higher latitude with the progression, it has to go to the lower latitude and so on, also needs to be explained. Again, coming back to uh, these properties, and again, I'm overemphasizing this because it is a very important property. So I see in the, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, this is a magnetic region called bipolar magnetic region. You see the, the white guys, one polarity is in the right side. Of course, the orientation must be like this. Yeah, and this is the tilted angle. And if I look at the southern hemisphere, this is the sunspot pair, and the orientation of the uh, uh, of the polarities is different. So the direction of the line of force is different, and the tilt angle also is shown. So all these has to be reflected. So now what we create is earlier otherwise only showing about the location of the sunspot. So that's what's called the sunspot butterfly diagram. Now what I am showing is the magnetic butterfly diagram. Now I have a way of measuring magnetic field. I have a way of finding out where these magnetic field concentrations are there and so on. So these are certain, uh, you know, uh, as I said, Zeeman effect, uh, uh, spectral line information you use and make this observation. So the beauty of this is what is happening is here, at the beginning of the cycle, you see lots of sunspots and they are all appearing in the higher latitude. And with the progression, you see there are hardly any, you know, few sunspots. Some days there are no sunspots at all and so on and so forth. So which is, if you take this particular, you know, gold schematic, I'm rotating for one solar cycle, which is called 27 days, well, not solar cycle, one solar rotation, which is 27 days. And then I stack this 27 day map into a movie. So that 27 day map is being pushed into a movie and then you see this behavior. So now we are in the solar minimum, hardly any sunspot, new sunspot, I mean, maxima has come. I mean, solar cycle has appeared and you see lots of sunspots and so on. So if you now translate these movie into a, a magnetic butterfly diagram, you will see this picture. Here, there are a few things to be noted. The yellow fellows, one polarities, they appeared in some, some somewhere, say probably around plus minus three degree latitude. They, with the progression of the solar cycle, they are moving towards the equator. They are moving to the equator. But another thing is happening is, there is another polarity which is sort of diffusing our way and so on and so forth. The yellow guys, they are actually going towards the pole. And another interesting aspect we have to notice here is that the sun's pole also has a polarity, magnetic polarity. So northern hemisphere could have a uh, north polarity, but suppose this is, uh, you know, blue is not, uh, you know, north polarity, but this south polarity guys, they came up and they eat up this, you know, uh, blue ones. So that's what is the cancellation of magnetic fields. And then a new polarity you know, is happening. So after 11 years, the polarity of the North Pole, which was North, will become South. So this is called the polarity reversal. So Sun, if you are considered as a dipole, the dipole magnet actually flips. Every 11 year, it flips. So if you really want to have a theory, you have to also be able to explain this flipping. So you see there are lots of properties a theory has to explain. So again, this is a repetition summary of what I have said, that there has to be an equator board migration of active region. And these blue guys come towards the equator and the yellow guys from the other hemisphere, they come to equator, they cancel each other and you have a minima where you will find that there is hardly you know, any sunspots. Whereas the weaker field, they will go towards the pole and the polar field reversal will happen because these weaker yellow field will uh, cancel the pre-existing two fellows and then eventually the polarity of that, uh, that particular northern hemisphere will flip. And uh, again, this will repeat after 11 years and so on and so forth. So we have to explain all this. How it is explained now, there is something called a dynamo. Uh, uh, sir, uh, your mic has been muted.
Okay, sorry about oh. that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, somebody may not be liking my talk, so <laughs> anyway. Um, no longer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, yes, sir. Now it is audible. And the presentation is on? Yes, sir. The presentation is on. Okay, so let me go back to the full presentation more. You are able to see the full screen? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. So we start with a poloidal field, and because of the rotation, it generates a toroidal field. What is uh, can be depicted as this? You start with, uh, as I said, not south, uh, you know, direction aligned magnetic field lines. But as I mentioned earlier, sun doesn't rotate as a rigid body. It rotates as a differential. It means equator is rotating faster than the pole, and because of that, the field lines get wrapped around. Hmm? So when you get a wrapped around thing, essentially, to start with, you had a polar field become a toroidal field because r theta. If some mathematics you have done in the past, you will uh, realize that that generates a phi uh, you know, direction. Because of this toroidal field generation, you have sunspots on the surface. Now, as I said, the bipolar tilted active regions of sunspots are formed. The negative wise guys will go towards the pole. They will interact with the pre existing positive fellows. The positive fellows will go towards uh, the equator. And from the other hemisphere, the opposite polarity is going towards the equator. They will cancel each other. We will get the solar minima. And uh, because of these cancellation, you will get the polarity reversal. So this is a complete story. And of course, how you get back from the toroidal field to the polaridal field, there is another thing happening, which is called the meridional flow. Inside the sun, between, within the convection zone, there is a conga belt. So this conga belt, you see this arrow, which is actually dragging these you know, polar field all the way back to the disorbitation zone. So that becomes the seed field for the duration of the next cycle. So that becomes a complete cyclic process as it is indicated there. Of course, inside the sun, it is uh, very turbulent. There is diffusion. There are lots of physics which you have to worry about. And uh, I'm not going to get details on that. So solar cycle, we need two components. One is the toroidal component. Toroidal components are represented by the sunspots, whereas colloidal fields are very weak. There are only few Gausses. You know, these are you know, uh, you know, slow Gauss kind of thing, and the polar field because of the cancellations and all that is, is very very tiny. So it's very very difficult to really measure the polar field, and it's it's uh, really really uh, you know tight to uh, get that polar field measurement. So we have uh, you know a lot of struggle in getting the polar field. This is again an animation and and uh, you know, visualization of the theory which I was talking about is called the Dynamo theory, uh, which is a now reasonably well established theory. Some of my colleagues uh, they do it in Kolkata, uh, in in uh, Isa Kolkata. The Bindu who was originally in the U.S. is back and his uh, you know students and uh, and the center does all of the, a lot of these calculations. So there's a you know, very well developed you know, dynamo theory, which can explain the solar cycle and so on. Now, I will, last five minutes, I will talk about briefly, are there the sun observations available in India? The answer is yes. This is a unique resource. This is a picture of our Canal Observatory. On the top of the uh, hill, we have this observatory. We have a telescope uh, with this meter objective, uh, which is operational for 120 years. Nowhere in the world probably you will find such a telescope which is still takes one image per day and we take it in an extra film. Just for you know historical reasons, we are still continuing the observation. And this is a unique, unique data source. As you can imagine that to understand the solar cycle, we need uh, long-term data. It's just not few days data which is uh, you know which is adequate, which is enough. So we have to ha go back to the history and see you know what is all we have. In Kudekana, we have data from 1904. And you know, we have digitized all these data with wearing photographic uh, films or in, in plates, photographic plates, and all these data is available to the global community. Just for an example, you know, this is an image on 1st January 1958. We have image from uh, what's from calcium and we have image from H alpha. We can also block the uh, solar disk and take some images. These are they're called prominences uh, taken from, again, a calcium tape filter. Uh, I will not go into details, but you know, I know you, uh, quite a few of you are uh, pretty expert in, uh, in taking images. 
and if uh, some discussions are necessary, we can do it. But the point what I want to again emphasize, this is a unique source. This is a gold mine, you know, which we have in India. And I, have, I take the pride to be able to complete this digitization exercise, which has been initiated long back. But uh, with my effort and my students and so on, I have been able to complete this exercise. All the data is available through uh, this portal to the global community. And that really, really, I tell you, lots of new, uh, you know, high quality research papers are coming. And, you know, this is only a list, short list, which is uh, my uh, students have uh, published in the last few years. We also have uh, calcium images. I just wanted to, uh, you know, show you what we have, uh, we have done. This is actually a photographic play. Right. So what we do is we take image of these, uh, you know, photographic plate again with a very sophisticated, uh, you know, 16 bit digitized uh, CCD camera with the 4K by 4K CCD, which is maintained at minus 70 degree to, you know, reduce the noise and, and so on. And uh, just for, you know, some of you are very, uh, you know, very good <laughs> in, uh, in image processing and so on. Uh, we'll understand the you know uh, seriousness of this. Of course, we can produce this butterfly diagram from uh, from calcium, which represents the chromosphere. This is all from uh, you know uh, regional data, and uh, this is what you know this data archive. Uh, you know we have. Uh, I uh, widely you uh, publishize this, and uh, if people are interested, they can download some data and uh, do some uh, small little experiment on their own also, just for just for, for fun. You know. And, and this is my team, uh, my under the students team, often they, they're named as Vipul's gang. Uh, but this gang, is, this was taken about three and a half years back, I think, 80% has, uh, has moved out of India. But this is the current gang I have uh, with my students and postdocs. Of course, for the sunspots, there are only uh, probably two uh, out of this gang who are working. I also work with the Aditya mission, uh, so, uh, you know, if some other opportunity comes, uh, I will be able to share my excitements about uh, you know this dedicated uh, solar mission. What we have uh, next year, hopefully uh, launched from a ISO platform. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, it's really an enlightening lecture. And now I again request uh, Shoikot sir to. Please. So, yes, take off the uh, you know, share screen, or if some question comes in, I can bring back some slides. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. So, we will be going through the questions people have posted in the chat box, and we'll okay. get back to you. We will we'll ask it to you, and you answer, and they'll get the answers. Sure. Yeah. But uh, everything said and done. So, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Oh, thank you for wonderful, wonderful, simply wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, it's a request to all the participants, and you've been doing it very categorically. You've posted your questions in the chat box. Give us a couple of seconds. We will go through the chat box, sort out your questions, and ask Professor Banerjee your questions, and he'll be very glad to answer as he said just now. Just bear with us. Dibankar. Yes, sir. Uh, so, should we start? Uh, yes, uh, there is a uh, just a minute. There is a question from Monalisa Khatun that does the sun get benefited having those spots? If so, how it would be? Okay. Uh, um the sun doesn't know that there is probably a such part. I think I can, I can pose the question slightly differently. That uh, if there are no sunspots, whether there is any changes which is expected inside the sun and things like that. So the answer would be uh, probably no. Because you see, the, the presence of the sun or the star is because of the nuclear reactions which is happening in the base of the, uh, I mean, in the core. Hmm? And the sunspots is a result of uh, magnetoconvection, which is happening in the 30% depth of the uh, of the sun. So of course there is some link in the sense if uh, the sunspots uh, you know uh, are not there, as I tried to uh, give you a, a clear picture, that it will definitely affect us, our climate, our weather. I did not talk about one particular area at all, which is called the space weather. 
basically these huge explosions which happens in the sun they eject a lot of material huh? so these large volume of material they travel through the interplanetary space and suppose there is a satellite in this interplanetary space that satellite will be directly affected by this plasma which is coming from the sun so it is important for us to understand that whether there are possibilities of certain these kind of these are called solar storms uh, because of the solar flares there is normally a, something called coronal mass ejection and there's this ejecta this storm you know comes towards uh, us and then if it uh, if there is a satellite will get uh, damaged it can also reach earth's atmosphere fortunately earth has its own magnetic uh, field and that's called magnetosphere and that protects us from these kind of you know highly energetic uh, big blob which is coming towards us so uh, again coming back to your uh, your question original question yeah i mean the sunspots uh, probably uh, cannot uh, you know really control the uh, the basic uh, reaction which is happening inside the core of the sun so the sun's uh, own life cycle sunspots do not make a, a big difference but again sun when it becomes you know a much uh, uh, you know older than so on but there will be certain changes and of course the same way the sunspot will not be formed and so on okay hope uh, you have got your answer and the next question is from Preeti Priyadarshini Pradhan, that why the sunspots are relatively cooler than the rest of the surface of the sun? Okay, okay, very good question. So what happens is sunspots are magnetic regions. So I uh, I indicated in that particular uh, cartoon that uh, inside the maybe I can pull out uh, my slide again uh, somewhere and it will be easier to explain and you will understand uh, the physics a little better. Here, what you see is that uh, for any uh, you know any object, you need to have a pressure balance. Hmm? So the the pressure inside uh, inside the sun uh, you know sunspot has to be equal to the pressure outside. Now, outside there is only plasma. Huh? There is no magnetic field, and inside the sunspot there is uh, pressure due to uh, the you know thermal property of the plasma, and there is a pressure. Because of the you know presence of the magnetic field, which is a positive quantity, so already you can see that uh, pressure outside is more than the pressure inside, uh, the plasma pressure. And pressure and density and temperature are directly proportional. If you just assume the you know um, uh, ideal uh, gas law, and then immediately you will see that the temperature inside, either uh, outside, is more than inside. So that's the reason the temperature is inside. From directly physical, uh, to, you know, just simple logic, that uh, it's a cooler, you know, material because there is an the existence of uh, magnetic plasma which has its own pressure. Just to keep the pressure balance, yeah, temperature will be lower inside. Okay. Okay. Uh, before going into the next question, I would like to request all the participants here and also in the YouTube live streaming that the feedback form link has been provided in the respective chat box. Please do fill the form and submit it. Okay, sir. The uh, next question is from Shourav Hajra. That is there any other state of matter inside the sun ex except plasma? And how does the magnetic field affect the solar storm? Okay. Uh, there are two parts of the question. <laughs> so, so the first of all, uh, you have, you know, we are familiar with three states of matter, but you know, when we, uh, you know, provide more and more heat, the, uh, the, you know, the solid becomes uh, liquid and then the gas, and the beyond gaseous state, it becomes a combination of, you know, ionized uh, particles and, and the neutrals and charges and so on and so forth. So, depending on the temperature. Uh, the plasma constituents and all that will be determined. But since sun is very hot, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the universe actually is the, the, the plasma state. It's only in our environment we see, you know, these three states of matter. But in the in the in the hot environment, you will not find any other matter other than the plasma state. It's just the composition will slightly change, and the ionization states will also change. Suppose you have the iron as an element. It can have iron 9 or iron 20. That means, you know, eight electrons knocked off from the outer orbit, uh, depending on the, you know, temperature of that plasma. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is, your question was about the CME and the, and the magnetic field. Basically, uh, these CMEs are coming from some kind of magnetic region. 
they come mostly from active region which although also has a magnetic field so they carry this magnetic field all the way into the interplanetary space there are certain cmes you will also find it from huge uh, plasma uh, floating in the uh, in the in the chromosphere which are which are also sometimes called prominences so these prominences when they erupt that also give rise to uh, cmes and those cmes are nothing but a magnetic cloud they are also sometimes called magnetic cloud so there is actually a huge uh, you know importance about how this magnetic field is how much it is what is the orientation of the magnetic field within that blob uh, all these things matter quite a lot so cmes and magnetic field has a close close uh, relation okay the uh, we are taking a question from our uh, youtube live streaming the question was asked by sukhvinder kaur that does migration of coronal holes to lower latitudes related to solar cycle yeah it's again a very good question uh, uh, we do not understand it uh, it's uh, it's very well of course during the solar mini so probably for the benefit of all other uh, you know audience first of all uh, what she is referring to is about coronal hole coronal hole are cooler uh, uh, you know uh, regions in the corona normally it is found in the in the polar region particularly during the solar minima you we find lots of these coronal holes coming in the uh, in the polar region why coronal holes first of all comes we believe that sometimes because of this cancellation of the magnetic field you get formation of the coronal hole sometimes two active regions they interact with each other and then give rise to a equatorial coronal hole so what she is actually referring to is there some sort of direct understanding about the you know uh, location of these coronal holes with the solar cycle uh, we are still on the job Uh, there is still not clear understanding a lot of people are working on this and uh, we don't find actually one to one correspondence of that but there is definitely uh, the polar coronal holes are seen to be much longer uh, much bigger and more prominent uh, during the solar minima because you don't see much uh, you know active regions at all so this is a direct consequence of that as well Okay. Uh, the next question. Oh, there is in fact a question from Shobhi Kornukar. The first question is, why the area of paired sunspots are not same? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Ideally, you know, on the ideal situation, if you have just uh, two sunspots, you will see that you know both should match with each other. It is just a single flux tube, right? But to be honest. this flux tube uh, geometry or this cartoon what we are saying is to basically understand the physics of it reality is much more complicated it is not always that in an active region there are only two uh, sun spot there could be 30 40 sun spots also you know so uh, so this ideal flux tube scenario is a visualization we normally invoke for better you know understanding but in reality what happens is if you just do a simulation and all that you will see that they these magnetic flux flux concentrations are, can be very irregular shaped as well so uh, because of it's just a result of convection and the magnetic field the way it interacts with each other and rotations and all that so uh, i in reality we never see that it's all you know matching with uh, each other perfectly it's a good point and good observation also probably yeah. and his second question is uh, is there any magnetic energy loss between two paired spots yes so what happens is uh, so this is what the magnetic cancellation is all about and since you asked the question uh, very nicely that if they are not having the equal uh, you know uh, magnitude and sizes and so on so forth effectively when they cancel you can live with a small excess also depending on which was, was the bigger so always magnetic cancellation event uh, by merging to two opposite polarities leave behind one small polarity also so that's also seen very very clearly uh oh there is a, uh, a similar question from sulogno mohan that how do sunspots affect the planet earth okay uh, so the sunspot as i indicated uh, already probably some part of the answer is already stated that the sunspots are the regions whereby uh, you know we see large uh, concentrations of uh, plasma and uh, there are lots of motions and so on and these uh, 
instabilities and this evolution of these uh, concentrated magnetic field regions give rise to big flares. I did not talk about that subject also today. And those uh, flares lead to coronal mass ejection. And then eventually, they will carry all the way to Earth's atmosphere. Depending on uh, you know how much energy this uh, magnetic uh, cloud is carrying, you know what is the orientation of the magnetic field, which is again somewhat linked with the orientation of the sunspot pairs on the surface. You see, there is a direct link. You know, uh, uh, so all these will uh, you know sort of affect our atmosphere, our own uh, you know magnetosphere. Uh, so that also has an orientation. Uh, so all these actually play a role in deciding whether it will be you know harmful for us or not. I uh, hope you put your answer. The next question is from YouTube N from Sravanti Chattopadhyay. That is there any relationship between the solar flares and sunspots? Of course, there is a relation simply because you know the flares tend to happen uh, you know between opposite magnetic field you know uh, regions, and uh, sunspots are those uh, you know, routes you can say. Basically, what you see image in the atmosphere, all these big flux tubes and so on and so forth, that are anchored. Uh, their foot points are the sunspots. Huh? I mean, sunspots are there in the white light and the surface, but they are there all the way in the atmosphere. They're actually like pillars. Huh? So if you would take this structure and then you would twist this structure, then this you can actually even compare with a situation when you have a uh, you know string uh, or a rubber band. You take the rubber band and then you start uh, them twisting. So beyond certain number of twists, your this uh, rubber band snaps. So when the rubber band snaps, if you think about the big flux tubes, which is containing you know uh, several thousands of kilometer size, uh, very hot coronal plasma, that they are ejected. So that's what is called uh, a flare. And of course, this is just not one string which is required. We need multiple string, and then they uh, you know talk to each other or interact with each other, which gives rise to a process called magnetic reconnection, which again I did not talk about, and now which is invoked. That the flares are nothing but a manifestation of the magnetic reconnection. That happens because of these opposite magnetic uh, aligned field lines. They are forced to interact with each other and then give rise to a magnetic reconnection process where this entire amount of magnetic energy can be converted into kinetic energy and heat and so on. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Shobha Kadam Survey that can we correlate intensities of geomagnetic storms? Uh, within bracket, which are measured by DST index, which solar cycle and predicts more intense geomagnetic storms. Yeah, again, uh, for the benefit of uh, other uh, audience, so uh, geomagnetic storms are uh, essentially what she's talking about are uh, disturbances in Earth's uh, atmosphere. So, Earth, as I indicated, has magnetosphere. So, this magnetic field lines protect us uh, from these huge uh, blob of plasma which is uh, coming and so on. So typically what will happen is when you have more number of sunspots, hmm, you have more probabilities of flares, you have more probabilities of CMEs. So during the solar maxima, you will have more of these CMEs. Obviously, directly, you will have more geomagnetic storms. In during the quiet phase, when you do not have sunspots, you do not have flares, you do not have CMEs. So obviously, the number of geomagnetic storms will be also less. So, in principle, there is a direct correlation of the activity cycle and the geomagnetic storms. But there are other more, some more factors involved. As I indicated, this uh, this uh, magnetic cloud which is coming, what kind of magnetic uh, orientation is there? That actually is quite crucial to dictate whether magnetic storm or uh, you will see a DSC, a big DSC change, and and so on. This is a parameter which is measured. Uh, uh, from Earth's uh, atmosphere as well. In the ground magnetic field is measured actually. Yeah. Yeah, there is a question uh, not directly related to the sun, but related to amateur observers that uh, what is the scope of amateur observers in this regard? Okay. So uh, I think uh, Mr. Shoikot very nicely uh, 